Welcome back. Our symposium too will begin shortly. Before we start, please be reminded that participants can drop your question for our panelists in the Slido link provided in the coming section. Before we introduce the panelists, we are sorry to announce that our initial panelists, Dr. Usamuddin Haji Yaakob, will not, be able, will not be able to join us today. We hope to have him again in our future symposium. Now, let us welcome our honorable panelists for the second symposium. Professor Dr. Edmund Terence Gomez, a professor of political economy at the Faculty of Economics and Administration, University of Malaya. Yang berhormat Tony Puakiamwi, member of parliament for Mansara, and Dr. G. Manimaran from the Rasa Buster core team. Our moderator for Symposium 2 is Ms. Cynthia Gabriel, the founder and executive director of the Center to Combat Corruption and Cronism, C4. The title for the symposium is Corruption in Development Can We Be Clean? Now, we will like to pass the floor to them. Please welcome our honorable panelists and moderators. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, really exciting panel uh, on the uh, Malaysian Universities Economic Conference. It's called Corruption in Development Can We Be Clean? Very simple question, but very difficult to answer. Now, uh, we have for the next hour and a half a very brilliant panel before us. Uh, we have not just three very brilliant men, three very outstanding personalities in their respective fields. We have um, an outstanding academic. And I think everyone knows Professor Terence Gomez, as was introduced earlier. He's also the dean of the economic faculty. We have um, MP Tony Paul uh, of the Damansara constituency. Um, He's also my MP. I'm a vocal and constituent. So there will be some questions that I think will be posed to him directly uh, as well from my side. And uh, Dr. G. Manimaran, someone who I know for the many years that I've worked on anti corruption, has been really consistent on communications, corporate communications, and trying to figure out how to actually get uh, anti-corruption more popular with our communities and our different communities. So here we have a very interesting panel, and I can guarantee you a very interesting afternoon uh, with different kinds of comments, not everyone agreeing to be on the same page all the time, but that's what makes it fun. And I'm going to be a moderator for this afternoon, so I get to ask some difficult questions, and I hope that you'll take turns to answer. Now, there's uh, the format is going to be like this. Each panelist will get about eight minutes to make their introductory remarks. And following that, we will have a more interactive forum with questions being posed to the different panelists and also the most popular questions being put up on uh, Slido. There will be instructions for you on how to post your questions on Slido. And this will be then picked up and actually asked to uh, the different panelists. Now, uh, each of these uh, uh, personalities will cover different areas of uh, corruption, issues, the challenges that we are facing today, and uh, what, what we need to do. I think we need to spend quite a significant amount of time not just outlining the problems, but actually looking at real serious uh, recommendations. The country is in a state of confusion, in a conundrum. As I speak today, I just read the news that Anwar is being called to the parliament, uh, to, to, sorry, not to the parliament, to meet the king, uh, because of what's happening in parliament and many fake things. News, fake news. Not true? Not true. But whatever it is that the media is reporting, we keep catching up with it every hour. But how is it affecting the economy? Where's corruption in all of this? I think this is what we want to answer today. Okay, so let me start with uh, Prof. Terence. Um, over to you for the introductory remarks on the session, Corruption in Development, Can We Be Clean? Dr. Yamut. 
you're muted, bro. Sorry about that. I've only eight minutes, so let me dive into this quickly. First, I must say this is a very interesting question, a very provocative question. The question that has been we've been asked to deal with is corruption in development, can we be clean? Of course, the answer is yes, but it's not as simple as that. The question also is, why have we not been clean? There is the question also is, how is it that we have had development with serious corruption? Now, if you go back to the 1970s and 1980s, if you look at the growth rates of South Southeast Asia and East Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Korea, Taiwan, phenomenal growth rates. But at the same time, in all these countries that I mentioned, we also saw serious corruption. Meanwhile, at the same time in Africa and Latin America, they also had serious corruption, but they had a process of underdevelopment. So this is a paradox. If in both regions, the volume of corruption is about the same. In fact, some would argue in some countries like even, for example, China, they grew at three times the rate with the same amount of corruption. How is how do you explain that difference that we experience this kind of development with in spite of corruption while other regions didn't? Africa can also be included here apart from Latin America. Now, I want to answer this by first defining what I mean by political corruption. I'm speaking here specifically political corruption. Here, what I'm talking about is abuse of public authority for personal gain. Very clear, abuse of public authority for personal gain. This is not corruption legally defined. To answer this question, I want to expose you all to two types of corruption, developmental corruption and degenerative corruption. In the case of Latin America and Africa, what we saw was degenerative corruption. That means when funds and resources were distributed between politicians and businessmen, they were not used productively. What this means is that resources were not, these resources given by politicians to businessmen were not invested in the economy. They even channeled out of the country. One, one country in Southeast Asia where we saw this kind of degenerative corruption was the Philippines under Marcos. And here you have embezzlement, you have theft going on. You have kleptocracy. The other type of corruption is developmental corruption. Now here, what you see is when the government gives a particular concession or rent to a business figure, there's a transfer of property rights and the businessman in the allocation process of these resources uses it productively. He invested, he will invest it in the economy and there's economic growth. So when a businessman receives a contract or a license, he wants to make profits out of this. Interestingly, too, much of these profits are also plowed back into the political system, given back to the politicians. Now, this kind of developmental corruption existed for a long time in Malaysia. Let me show you this in concrete terms between two types of administration before 2009 under Barisan National, uh, particularly during the administration of Mahathir Mohamad, and after 2009 under the administration of Najib Razak. In the period during the uh, Mahathir's rule, what we saw was the emergence of what we call selective patronage and abuse of power. There was lack of transparency in the way the government distributed contracts to business figures. But in these contracts that were given, although there was serious abuse of uh, power and he was severely criticized for it, we saw development. For example, we saw a satellite TV, Astro, emerging as a major player. Telecommunications Maxis emerged as a major player. There were questions about these contracts and how they were awarded. The IPPP, the power generation plants, uh, they were also given, and there was production, uh, productive use of these licenses that were given. There were also bad outcomes. We have cases of uh, Halim Saad and Tajuddin Ramley, and they fell after 1997. And at that period also, what we saw in, in Mahathir's administration was the use of the stock market to create conglomerates, privatization, invest these uh, companies that you have, or these rents you've got into a company, privatize it, and the company grows. There's a transaction, it's market driven. And this ownership, because it's in the market, is widely held. And you can see here from this, uh, there was a kind of production, if you heard the earlier session, they talked about rapid development in Malaysia during the 1980s and 1990s, in spite, as I might again remind you, of corruption. Now, what we didn't see here was too much use of GLCs. They were brought in only when the economy collapsed in 1997, and then they were used to bail out. What is also important is when we see this kind of 
patronage and business political links. We also see the use of money. Where does the money come from? Where was money raised? It was raised from the domestic markets. It was raised through stock market transactions. And this money was invested into the political system. We see here the growing monetization of politics. What is also interesting is when the money came, it went into, in this case, Amno's accounts. When Mahathir stood down, he gave Abdullah, it is recorded, 1.2 billion ringgit worth of cash and assets. Now let's compare this with the Najib period. In the Najib period, as we now know, is well recorded, serious levels of corruption. We were even called, the country was called the kleptocracy. So compare kleptocracy now with patronage system before that. Here, many of the transactions were speculative. The business figures were linked to Najib or people such as Joe Lowe. And what did Joe Lowe do? You know, Joe Lowe invested in, uh, in movies. He took the money out of the country. It was a very different kind of political business style, hardly unproductive, no economic growth in the country from this kind of rent distribution. Another thing which uh, Najib's administration was distinct for as compared to the previous administrations was the serious abuse of GLCs and GLICs, government linked investment companies. We now know the case of Minister of Finance Incorporated and who can forget 1MDB, uh, Tony Ford did a lot of work on 1MDB and exposing the kleptocracy that occurred under Najib's uh, administration. And here you don't see a clear distinction between government and personal business ties, not market focus. The other thing that we saw under this administration was the use of where did the funds come from, the financing of politics. Here what we could see was foreign firms were now channeling money into the political system by Ma Najib's own, ad own admission. He had political donations that were coming from abroad for him to use for his political activities. And in terms of money, where did the money go? The money didn't go into Amno's accounts. Amno did not even know of these donations that were coming from abroad. 2.6 billion ringgit was later found to be in Najib's account. These are all by his own admission. So what I'm trying to show you here is two generations of politicians where on one hand, you can see what was called as developmental corruption. The other I would classify as more degenerative corruption. For a long time, many people said developmental corruption was okay. After all, Malaysia industrialized, the economy was booming, a new middle class emerged. And then in 1997, when the Asian economic crisis occurred, everything collapsed, that argument went out the window. You cannot justify developmental corruption. Corruption is corruption. And serious reforms were introduced, corporate governance reforms. OECD said our corporate governance reforms were among the best in the world. So why didn't corruption stop? It didn't stop because although we brought reforms in the corporate sector, we didn't bring reforms in the political sector. No institutional reforms. In fact, a lot of power was concentrated in the office of the prime minister, which when Najib came to power, abused significantly. What is my primary concern? We are now degenerating. We are now moving into serious degenerative corruption. And I'm saying this now because let's talk today. Today, what we are seeing is a system of patronage where we see, again, a lot of allegations of uh, concessions being distributed. The GLCs, which are key player in the economy, who is controlling the GLCs? It is controlled by the government and they are appointing politicians as directors. Why? To maintain the support that the, the political leaders need in parliament. This is a complete abuse of the GLCs system. The other thing which, which is very clear is there's no developmental agenda. We are talking about a shared prosperity vision, but the shared prosperity vision appears to be a mechanism for the continued practice of patronage, also race-based patronage. Although there was a lot of talk that we should have needs-based public policies. So what is, our, what is my main concerns of what is happening today that I'm so worried about? The growing control, the growing capture of the state by big business, when the Scott when we had the court cases recently uh, involving all our senior politicians, uh, Najib, Zahid, uh, what, what came out? The idea of checkbook politics, huge donations being made to politicians. Made through, also we now found out, foundations, covert funds directly going into the accounts of politicians. And in return, there were allegations that they had contracts given to them through the government. The other main thing that I'm very, very worried about is the idea of businessmen entering politics.
the concept of the revolving door. We saw this in Latin America, very common, revolving door. Businessmen entering politics, using their money to enter into politics, becoming part of the political system. And we have seen that in a, a few cases now. This revolving door is not a good phenomenon. We saw the consequences of this in Latin America. State capture, as I mentioned earlier, the financing of politics, what happens when politicians not only finance politics, what happens when they even become politicians? And what are the outcomes? Serious monetization of politics. We even have allegations of now these kinds of funds being used for party hopping. Today, one of the greatest concerns we have today is party hopping, which is contributing to the instability that we are seeing here. Where is the money coming from for this party hopping? Because there are serious allegations of money being used for politicians to hop. I want to end on this note. We need major reforms. We need to put into place things we've been talking for the past decade. Just one thing, the Political Financing Act. There's no political will to introduce the Political Financing Act, which will go a long way to bring about uh, an end to some of these problems that I just mentioned. And what about the GLCs? We've been talking about reforming the GLCs for also about a decade. And no political will to reform the GLCs because it's a tool that can easily be exploited by politicians to serve their political and economic interests. And I want to end on this note. When the COVID pandemic occurred, the finance minister, Tunku Zafrul, said, we can save the economy by using, by resorting to the government ecosystem. What did he mean by that? He meant the GLCs, which are so deeply embedded in all sectors of the economy, can play a big role in saving the economy. And we saw that. The banking sector, monetariums and loans, mainly through the GLC banks. Uh, in telecommunications, they reduced the rates for telecommunications. Tanaga, another GLC, reduced the rates for power supply. And we saw in the first last year, there were some positive outcomes from when they used the GLCs productively. Are they still being used productively, especially now when the economy is in a serious dire straits in serious in, ser in a serious state let me end here with these points uh, these are my opening remarks Cynthia let me pass it back to you and we can take these points that I've discussed through the Q&A thank you Cynthia thank you Prof that was really an amazing summary uh, sorry I, I was just giving you eight minutes but I promise I'll come back to you with more questions so you have more chances to elaborate on some of the very very important stuff that you highlighted an amazing eight minutes to start us off to stimulate the conversation. Now, I'd just like to move on to uh, YB Tony Poir to pick up on some of the uh, pointers as well as what you want to say about this whole issue of corruption in development. Can we be clean? But can you also please address the issue of uh, party hopping, of political financing, and uh, the trust deficit that is currently circulating and deepening uh, with the political process and many of the uh, politicians that uh, we have before us. Of course, your painting on the Sheraton move and many other things that actually uh, give out the, the very important things we need to hear uh, from, uh, from a member of parliament. Your turn. You're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah. Sorry, um, I was quite happy to do a five minutes introductory remarks and hand the mic back to you uh, for discussion. But you have just given me a question that I need twenty five minutes to reply. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Um, I think Doctor um, uh, Gomez has uh, given Prof Gomez has given a very good. Uh, introduction in what I see as one hand in the clapping process. One hand. So I, I think it's excellent. I won't answer your question, not because I don't want to answer your question, but because 80% uh, of what he said, I agreed with. 20% that I didn't agree with were just nuances. So so, so there's that. I, I won't touch on that. What I want to talk about in that five minutes is the other hand. And, um, and, and it relates to the question that we actually face today, can development economy be clean of politics? And I think it's a question, the other hand, who this other hand is, really is the people and the society. How tolerant are we of corruption 
within our society and hence by extension our political system um, i think it is not in question that we have a relatively high degree of tolerance relative to many other developed countries uh, it is quite often in the past where you hear people talking about it's okay for projects to give away 5, 10, 15 percent in commission as long as the project gets done. Now, people are happy to accept that. It is okay for me to get stopped by the policeman on the road block without my belt on and giving him 20 ringgit or 50 ringgit, whatever the market rate was at that point in time, to get away from paying a summons. People are quite happy doing that. And the tilt, the change, the tipping point came perhaps in 2018 when Najib's uh, extravagance, when Malaysia went down the slippery slope of corruption where 15, 20% is no longer enough. We are talking about just out outright, uh, what do you call it, misappropriation, outright uh, 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 stealing from the vault into your personal account. It, it went to that stage before the nation got so upset with the degree of corruption that finally a decision, and even then a controversial one, you know, is somewhere gray area, to get rid of the government. Now that, 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 that was what took place. But what is perhaps slightly worrying today is that you're beginning to hear voices of people out there saying Najib wasn't so bad after all. You know, things are bad today because the, the, the people in power who took power behind by, by the back door uh, are running the country to the ground. Administrative incompetence. To the extent that, let's forgive Najib for all the money he stole us, he was managing the country better. The people were actually reminiscing for Najib's time. It, it, it's serious. Okay, perhaps not everyone is, but there is that 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 backsliding sentiment. So it boils down to the question of priority in fighting corruption among the society. The more the society is tolerant of corruption relative to other priorities, then the more corruption will grow. And in this case, my, my, my take on corruption is always, you can never accept 5%, 10%. Even if economically speaking, perhaps partly as what Dr. Uh, Gomez uh, uh, mentioned just now, uh, it's still very good because 5%, 10% doesn't affect much your economic growth. It only reduces your achievements by a little bit, but you still grow a lot. So it's good results. Happy to take 5% discount, 10% discount. But it's a slippery slope because once you have 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, you can never stop. Someone will always want more. And hence, you must actually always draw a hard line as to whether you accept or don't accept corruption. But the society does not necessarily think that way. And that forms a basis as to whether politicians will remain corrupt or happy to be corrupt okay, going forward in Malaysia. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. I'll return the mic to Cynthia and then perhaps we can discuss more after this. Okay. Interesting. But you'll get your 25 minutes to explain the other contentious hey, session only one hour <laughs> to touch on. but some of the things you said are actually pretty important because uh we're going back to the heart of what uh prof terence also spoke about which is uh, the patronage system so um with you in finance ministry for a while uh, i think there's a lot of questions also with regard to the procurement system and how is it that uh, we see ourselves looking at uh, remedies, looking at ways to reform? Because 5%, 10%, 15%, 
is something that grew with the system and whether systemic changes that are required as opposed to looking at people rejecting it, uh, whether we need to have a legislative framework, etc. We'll come back to discuss that. But now I'd like to move to uh, Dr. G. Uh, Mani Maran from Raswa Busters. Uh, he has a very colorful uh, career as a journalist and investigative journalist and also a, a corporate communication journalist. He's been in the MECC for a number of years and that's where I first met him. So we have some interesting questions posed uh, by the organizers as well as I think on Slido. Even Tun Dr. Mahate in his keynote speech today spoke a lot about uh, combating corruption, not just in the developing development sector, but also among uh, difficult issues of political corruption, uh, reforms around what is actually required, and uh, where do we move next. So I'd like you to touch a little bit also on the MECC, on uh, independent institutions, as uh, Prof. Karen's mentioned, and uh, what kind of role and function we need for in investigative justice to do a, uh, a kind of job that Claire Rucastle did, uh, the Wall Street Journal reporters, who actually helped us so much with uh, the 1MDB. Without them, we would never have known uh, the extent and details of uh, the sophistication of Nigeria's corruption. So there's a huge role here for journalists, uh, for institutions, uh, to call out corruption, to report corruption, to actually whistleblower protection, and many other different things like that. So over to you, your opening remarks. Uh, you've got eight minutes. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, thank you for inviting me to Rasa Busters on behalf of uh, Sabaster that to some then make it today is not well. Um, so he asked me to send his regard to everyone today. And also regard to YB, Tony, and Prof Gomex. Uh, good to meet, good to see you all in this platform after many years. Um, and I must thank you all, both all three of you, when I was in MSCC as my one of my role to uh, as uh, corporate communication uh, media consultant at MSCC to to build a bridge uh, between stakeholders, politicians, uh, CSO, academician, which is your role as a media person, so-called I also a media practitioner in that platform, helped me a lot to bring what they call increase the perception and uh, collaboration between the outsiders, the stakeholders and MSCC at large. So, um, <coughs> I'm beginning with the, to answer the question, the corruption in development first. I have uh, two points that to, which I need to take from what Prof. Gomex mentioned earlier. The question is whether we can do it or not. Yes, I'm very confident we can do it. We have done little changes for last, uh, since last 60 years. The change is not enough, we need to do more. For that, another point, Prof has mentioned about the aggressive institutional reform. For that, for me, from that perspective, I think we need a, what they call the mass movement and mass political will among the public at large, from the top, from when we have our king, we have our prime, our prime ministers, ministers, until the, the people at the school level. Everybody has need to have the political, what they are considered as a mass political will. We need, we can't, we can't give this responsibility and uh, this task to the politician in parliament and uh, to do, we need to do, uh, we need to move it. That's why we have started this call, our campaign movement, Raswa Busters. This was already six months ago, we form it. We, uh, we, we see Cynthia also part of that, uh, as one of the coalition members. We, today we have, we have uh, more than 300 members in that coalition of the willings. This is what we call as uh, the mass movement. Uh, we, we feel that uh, there's a gap, huge gap. What is the Prof. Gomex, uh, Tony, uh, YB Tony said earlier, there's a huge gap. The problem, you know the problem in front of us, the big elephant in front of us, the corruption, good governance, integrity, all these things we need to tackle it in a more holistic manner. 
That's why we feel that in RB, we, we know there's a lot of NGOs also outside there, they're doing their part. What we see today is directly or indirectly their role, their significant contribution that we have seen. While we, are not, we need to go far, far, far away to have a more better holistic uh, comprehensive changes. RB, uh, Resort Busters, um, we have a form of six sectors, five main sectors. There's a Malaysia free corruption. For Malaysia, that's a corruption free country. That is our main goal. Then we have a former sector called election free election, um, corruption free election, business free elections, youth that against the corruption, example. So we need to do more. The government that are free from corruption. So these are sectors we have to form. This is why, because we think that we need to bring the message, we need to mobilize our society, mobilize society, everyone, every individual to for to advocate and stress for the importance of uh, institutional reform that we have mentioned by Dr. Prof. Gomex. The role by play by the public. We stop, example, YB Tony said, police stop, but traffic officers, they're willing to pay future ringgit. Why? You have the, all the right not to pay. Some people pay, then they take the picture and say the police is corrupted. So we are part and, pass, part and pass, parcel of the problem. The public is a part and parcel of the problem. They also contribute to the problem. That's why my question is, we can stop the corruption. Yes, if everybody say we don't want to pay corruption, I think we can stop the 50% of the problem by tomorrow in 24 hours. If we want to do it, can. So whether the willingness, the political willingness among the public. So we feel that um, uh, we everybody we need to do from a historical perspective, from anti-corruption agency, we form Institute Integrity Malaysia 2004. Then we, we ACA was upgraded, become uh, commission, Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, we have done. This is all done because of the public demand public advocate for that. Are we enough? I, my personal opinion, I think this is our view in Russell Busters. We need to do more. We need to give more power, more strength to the Anti-Corruption anti -corruption Commission, more provision. What we can see in um, Indonesia, what we can see in Hong Kong. 2009 is just a, just a first step. We need to do more improvement, no changes in the constitution to give for more power, empower the commission and also to give more production. Come back to the role of the media, uh, investigative journalism. This is a good question. Uh, we need to empower, we need to have a media independence. Investigative journalism can be work if we have a better media independent landscape. We have a resources and skill for the reporters to do their work. We need to give the protection for the media protection for the media example in the whistleblower protection act we need to give them a kind of a protection or we need to do have a media council for them and we need to take out uh, get rid of a printing and press act example or we give them the freedom we can have a press commission that we that we have in uk so what i'm saying that we need to give, uh, we have a provision, I think we need to give more protection for the media, information get information freedom, uh, ex provision for the media to work and more independent. Some people ask whether our media are free. We won't say, I won't say, I will say free, but they're not totally free from political uh, ownerships because our ecosystem, media ecosystem in Malaysia, media consists of various types some owned by government, some owned by the political parties, some owned by the private entrepreneurs, some uh, owned by individual people. So in the in, the, in that big ecosystem, big eco landscape media system, we, some uh, media reporters, they said we are controlled by our editorial policy of the organization. Why are saying so? Because certain organizations, certain media organizations owned by political parties, they have to write what is good and in Malay we call chomel or beauty from their perspective, political master's perspective. We can't end that. We have seen last before before 2018 election, we have seen after 2018 election, those who opposition become government because then those who, be, those who government before 2018 become 
opposition, the media that they need to write only the beauty and the good things about the political parties masters. So some they although the corruption happened in that government, in that particular government, that particular time, sometimes they have to make it low, low profile, low down it the, the tone of the story. So uh, I feel that uh, for, for us to have um, the big uh, changes, uh, to see the changes in a big scale, as I said, uh, we need to have a mass movement, mass uh, political will among the every sectors of the public. If we're doing so, we can have so by giving the media in the independence in a more holistic manner, the professional skill for the and professional skill ethics for the media, and have the editorial policy that's a free for political influence, interest. Some people write story because, uh, because they have the political interest. We can't de and deny that every individual have their political ideology. When they come to journalism, some some way, some rather that will affect their political. Uh, uh, but I'm not saying that we are all the media, all the journalists are corrupted. No, we are no. We can't generalize that because so far we haven't. We have seen politi they are called by police or arrested by investigated by authorities. But there's no one journalist was uh, uh, what they call charged for the corruption so far last 60 years. But they exposed many stories. But what I'm saying that uh, people, some people say they receive money in the envelope or whatever. Yeah, some some receive money from the politicians in the form of token, but uh, I won't see this a corruption. But some editors, some especially the editors of the um, political own media, the chief editors are political appointee, so they have to write in line with what the political masters want to be right. That is the uh, that is the big scenario. But we can we can change it by educating the public, educating the uh, educating the uh, media practitioners, the journalists, editors. That's why we need to have investigative journalism in big way. In this, uh, I must share uh, here with with you all. Uh, three days ago, I've moderated uh, investigative journalism organized by TI Malaysia Transparency International. This is a good move, I feel. I think we need to do more, only including for the editors and chief editors, everyone. Because I know the day the news publication is a package. Gathering information is one step. Writing a story is second step. Editing is second step. Publishing is a step. So we need to do a, a more comprehensive media training. I think if we can do that, we can achieve. We can need to increase the professional skill and ethics among the journalists. So we can do together in this our mission to make uh, Malaysia a free caught up mission. I'll stop you now. That was a, a comprehensive uh, speech. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, I just wanted to uh, pose a round of questions. But I just wanted to pose a round of questions to some of the things you already said. Are you able to hear me? Yeah? Okay, great. Uh, for Prof. Terence, can you elaborate a little on uh, what you spoke about? Political appointments in jail and how you see that being a motivation for even for. Cynthia, we can't hear you. Cynthia, we can't hear you. But can I can I speak? Can you all hear me? Can I yeah, go ahead? I'll go ahead because uh, I got the gist of what Cynthia wants to say. Cynthia is still speaking, but she doesn't seem to realize we can't. Cynthia, we couldn't hear you what you said, but I got the gist of what you said. I want to come back to your first point about uh, politicians in GLCs. This is not a new phenomenon. This is a phenomenon that has been around for quite some time. Uh, we saw it during, uh, e uh, even during Bar Barca National's term. We saw it also during Pakatan's term. When Pakatan came to power, there was also serious concerns about uh, politicians who had been appointed to the GLCs. 
Now, here, I want to stop here to also make this point. Before the fall of the Barisan National, Mahathir, in his campaign in 2018, talked about how the GLC system had become a monster, and that monster required reform. So when Pakatan came to power, I thought one of the first things that uh, uh, Pakatan would do, especially since Mahathir referred to it as a monster, was to reform the GLCs, but it didn't happen. In fact, there was no attempt to re uh, revamp the GLCs, and there were subsequently also appointments by politicians to lead the GLCs. Then Pakatan fell. And when Pakatan took power, they took this appointment of GLCs, uh, GLC directors to a new level. Now, I would argue Pakatan didn't reform the GLC system, and Tony can correct me if I'm wrong here. This is my interpretation mainly because the GLC system was a system that had made enormous grassroots into the Malay rural constituencies. And if they, they needed to retain the GLC system to get support from that segment of the electorate. In the case of Ikatan, that's why they didn't reform it. In the case of Ikatan, when they came to power, of course, there's no question of reforming the GLC system. Instead, they appointed politicians who could not be given appointments in the cabinet to senior GLC positions. Now, this is a major injustice what they did because at the same time when they were doing that, the finance minister had openly said with the lockdown and all companies now sent home, since the private firms couldn't contribute to economic growth, who then could contribute to economy to saving the economy? And he said, we have to use the GLCs, which he did, as I mentioned in my talk. But at the same time, what he did was, or what Mohidin did was, they appointed politicians who were holding positions in parliament or a state assemblyman to also become GLC directors. And that's when the problem started. When they should have been using the GLCs to save the economy, they used it to prop up their government. And that's when why I say this was a serious abuse of responsibility on the part of the government, because by doing that, the institutions that were supposed to be used to save the economy was then becoming a sign cure for politicians to give them money to to further add on to their income as uh, as uh, elected representatives. Now the consequence of that is look at today, look at the consequence of uh, say Prasarana and what happened. We saw the problems with Prasarana. There are serious allegations of uh, impropriety involving the pharmaceutical related GLCs, for example, Pharmaniaga. And what of the health-related GLCs, those who run hospitals and what have been their contribution to the pandemic? So here, what we are having is because we do not have the right people sitting in the GLCs who should play a role in saving the economy, and instead it's being led by politicians who have no clue what to do with these GLCs, this is why we are having the serious crisis that we are confronted with today. So let me stop here, uh, Cynthia. That's the only part of the question I could hear from you. So I'm responding just to that part. Back to you, Cynthia. That they were trying to sort out some. Uh... Could we all mute our mics? Because then that could be causing the disruption for. Yeah. Uh, okay, but um, maybe uh, just to. Uh, despite the difficulties, I just want to have a little bit of a provocative session and ask uh, uh, YB Tony to respond. Uh, okay. To the point about MPs in GLCs and yeah, whether yeah. Uh, uh, you think yeah, yeah. that's okay or not. Um, let me let me let me be very quick about it because I do not want this session to become a polemic about. Uh, GLCs. I think the topic we're talking about is way bigger than just GLCs, but uh, I'll just be very quick uh, with regards to the points about GLC appointments. Um, it is a fact that certain uh, political leaders were appointed to statutory bodies during Pakatan Harapan's time. So we did have a differential, uh, and that's actually mentioned in our manifesto, uh, between GLCs like Saim Dhabi, like uh, MAHB, Malaysian Airports, versus, for example, uh, entities such as SEDA, which is the entity for uh, 
uh, to to help the Ministry of Energy do uh, solar and uh, the all the all the all the green energy initiatives, or in port authorities, okay, which are non commercial in nature. But the reason for that, part of the reason for that, is very simply that some of these agencies are by extension an extension of the ministry and hence needs to carry out basically the role or objectives or intent of the government of the day in these ministries. Okay? The presence of politicians in these entities does not uh, in any way negate that objective. I think that, that is the main reason for that. It's uh, These entities do not have profit motives. That means, for example, Port Clank Authority, the poor chairman is a chairman, non-executive, okay, oversees the board, gets paid 10,000 ringgit a month, if I'm not wrong, some, some figure like that, and that's it. It's not a lucrative position uh, in some big MNCs like uh, Saim Dhabi or, or, and so on. So there was a line. Uh, perhaps the line could be drawn better. Perhaps the line could be explained better. Perhaps the system can be improved better, but there's a basis for it. Even Prasarana, which technically is a GLC and is not a statutory body, Pakatan Harapan, we didn't appoint anyone there, but I feel there's actually justification if we did appoint someone there. Because Prasarana is by extension the agency for the Ministry of Transport to run public transport. It has to serve the government of the day you know, in running these objectives. But we didn't. We didn't appoint the politician into Prasarana. But I'm just trying to, to bring out the point that it is not as clear-cut or as black and white as perhaps what was presented. Okay, We had the line, uh, might be an artificial line drawn on the sand, but we had a line where appointments can only be made to statutory bodies and not at GLCs. Okay, that, that's, that's all I want to make on that particular point. Okay. Um, yes, this this uh, session is not about GLCs per se, but it's about the vehicle that's also being used as a conduit uh, to transfer funds and uh, to also build the reward system around what we uh, we so far. bodies can't do that. Statutory bodies cannot do that. Not supposed to do that, lah. You can't do that because they they are not they are not structured to do it. They're not, they're not structured to make money. Right. Okay. Now, um, I wanted to just add another question um, on, on that front, also uh, around this whole um, uh, effort uh, when Pakatan was in power around uh, public procurement. You know, the uh, finance minister Lim Guan Ng had made some kind of announcement in his budget speech. Yep. And then I'm not sure what happened to that. Uh, so could you enlighten us? Uh, and of course, now with the PN government and all, we don't know whether it's been, but at that so time, that, that, whether that was going to address the patronage system. There were there were a lot of uh, proposed uh, acts, that means uh, parliamentary acts, uh, that were to be tabled uh, in uh, subsequent uh, parliamentary sessions. We have announced it. Uh, the ministry was working on it. Uh, and subsequently, it's supposed to be passed to the AG office for approval. Uh, this included the Fiscal Responsibility Act, uh, included uh, the switch to accrual accounting as opposed to cash accounting, uh, as well as a Procurement Act that was to be put in place to govern procurement. Uh, obviously, once the government fell, all this went into the rubbish bin. So nothing happened since then. There was no mention, no progress. On these matters. But what we did do, despite not having an act during our time, is to make sure that the overwhelming majority of contracts, barring those with special exception, approved by the cabinet relating to national security, were allowed open tenders. And that's one of the reasons why we were quite unpopular among a certain segment of the business community. Doesn't matter Melayu or China. Okay, they were unhappy with us because we decided against having negotiated contracts. We did have ministers coming to MOF quite regularly, <laughs> seeking permission for directly negotiating negotiated contracts. 
And one thing good about my minister was that he's quite good at taiching and say, oh, this one's susala, this one, that one's susala, and then pushing it to somebody else to take responsibility, and then it was not approved. So, so one of the challenges we face, even when doing that, which is the right thing to do, no negotiated contracts, you want to do it, you do direct, uh, you, you do uh, a, a tender exercise, an open tender exercise, that also created a lot of unhappiness on two sides. One side is among some of our coalition partners who are unhappy with us. Is DAP very difficult to work with? And the other side is obviously among some of the business community who has ears to those in power who said that last time under Tun M so easy to do business. Nowadays are very difficult under Pakatan Harapan with Lim Guan Ying as the finance minister. So those are what I mean by uh, societal challenges, the mindset change that needs to take place as we transition from a, a, a corruption-based economy to one that actually wants to be corruption-free. And perhaps we don't have that uh, uh, strong enough a will to make that happen as yet. Okay? It's, it's not a transition that can happen overnight. It's a transition that needs all of us here, Mani, Cynthia, with your C4 and Prof, to continue talking about it, educating our society, to get everyone on board to see open tenders is always, always, always better than a directly negotiated contract. No problem. But I also want to uh, put this to all the other panelists as well, because there are many other things like a request for proposals and things like that that uh, became part of an issue of is it really open tender, is it not open tender, what is open tender and, and stuff. So I think what I'm trying to understand from what you're saying is that uh, it's a long process for uh, public education and that, that whole shift because people are used to doing business in a certain way and suddenly you, you know you try to change the system. Of course it's not going to uh, sit very well with the business yeah, community. Right. But I wanted to ask uh, the panelists here, wh what is your message to the business community, the private sector, the corporate sector, which is incredibly important also to help stem corruption? What do you want to say to them so that they would agree uh, that uh, it, it, it's tiring to actually put 2% or 0.5% to pay bribes, to get permits, to get licenses, etc. Is so there going to be a better investment climate with less corruption? I'm Not 2% or 0.5% or? More than that. Okay, More whatever than that the percentage. Uh, does anyone yeah. want to take that question before I move yeah, on to I the think, slide? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think... Uh, Maybe I, maybe I can share, Prof. Please. Uh, yeah, I think, um, as I said earlier, everybody must play a role. Of course, it's not an uh, easy task to do. Well, like YB said, it's not easy task to do. We are trying. We must keep trying. Advocate, educate every people, including the self, uh, what they call the private sectors. Why we can't go through open tender? They have to, they are, that will uh, increase their image of the corporate governance. That's what you're talking about. That's what uh, uh, what they call a uh, security commission talking about regulation, Ben Nagara talking about uh, regulation. Everybody must follow the regulation. If that's so, why we must go for non open tender? Yes, some uh, security element, like what to, why we say, yes, that one we agree. Yes, we need to respect, we need to do national aspiration we need to but other than that uh, we go for open tender why you must pay for get a project if we, and then we apply more costs on the public charge extra on the public and uh, public also must have uh, we need to educate the public those who are going for that kind of thing we need to boycott that kind of uh, private sectors business uh, that is my view i think um, that, but of course, it will take long term, a uh, long way to go, but we need to start. We need to put the pressure, we need to have the regulations on place, otherwise they won't. Yeah, okay. So you're advocating for better structural reforms and legislative frameworks in place. And maybe that's the way um, 
uh, to straighten the system. So people will just start following the rules and uh, with better enforcement and so on. Prof, your thoughts uh, on this? Yes, I would like to move the conversation away from the people and bring it back to the system, the political system, the governance system, more broadly speaking, the governance system. That's where the problem is. Now, if you look at the history, which I tried to show you all earlier, was that there's been a serious shift in power. Where is the power concentrated? Before there was more devolution of power, more distribution of power, but specifically during Mahathir's time, there became serious concentration of power in the office of the prime minister. And it became worse when the prime minister's office said, the prime minister also held the office of finance minister. That was really when everything went haywire. Now, what we have to deal with is understanding that system and looking at the location of power. Where is this power located? And can we do something to bring about a change in the system to ensure proper devolution of power to then ensure checks and balances are put in place? Uh, Pakatan didn't have enough time, I must say that. They did talk about institutional reforms. They had a special committee on that. And you know, uh, Cynthia, you were there too. Abiga was trying to do a lot of work there. Now, that's where the real problem, to my mind, is have we done those kinds of institutional reforms to reduce the volume of concentration of power in the office of the executive? They didn't do it, they didn't have time to do it, and then Ikatan comes in and now you see now the consequence of that. So rather than put going back to the people, I think people have made a statement, 2018 was a major statement, saying they had had enough with serious corruption. What about the Bursay movements? Look at the number of people who came out to support the Bursay uh, movement when they had their uh, street campaigns. That was a message. But what we politicians, uh, those in power, didn't do, or they are not doing now, is reforming that system. So let's take, for example, even MECC, the Securities Commission, the AG's office. We all know now, even if MECC does an investigation, it goes to the AG. The AG decides. The AG's role is to advise the government not to decide who gets prosecuted or who does not get prosecuted. They have to have a special office of the public prosecutor for such things. And that's why we're seeing this serious abuse of power. And the, one of the things that Prime Minister did was immediately to appoint an AG because the AG has that influence to determine what gets prosecuted, who gets prosecuted, who does not get prosecuted. So what do we have then? In 1997, as I said, when we had that serious uh, Asian financial crisis, we did significant corporate governance reforms. I mentioned this earlier. So Cynthia, to address your specific point about the business sector, there were major reforms in the corporate sector. The OECD said our corporate governance reforms were one of the best in the world. But why didn't it pan out in the way in which there was no corruption? Because it was not coupled with institutional reforms. And so what did we have? after 1997, also selective prosecution. Now, this is what we need to bring about. There's a real significant institutional reforms have to be put in place, change the system and how it works, devolve power that is constantly in the office of the prime minister. It's still there. It wasn't done also during Pakata's time. They didn't have time to push that through. Now that it's clear, we have to do this if you want to put an end to the corruption that we are seeing in government. No, absolutely. I think that is really quite uh, essential because uh, from 2018, when we overcame that monumental challenge of 1MDB, we still haven't changed the system. Another 1MDB can still happen. And it probably is happening. We don't know until another expose is called. I, I, I think we need a multi, multi prong uh, action, including what Professor say the system, the people, the education, everything, the politicians. I don't know why we you agree with not. This is a part of the the problem because of the, the three corner three corner issue. Uh, people need money from the politician during election. So politician need money from the the corporate sectors is a triangle issue. What do you think? Yeah, you agree? No, I agree. And I think uh, what I said at the start was that it's two hands. You know, there is the, the reforms that needs to take place on the governance side and that uh, these reforms must be matched with a public that is very strongly uh, against corruption. The public would include uh, the business entity uh, and the, 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 the public out there. 
it's a it has to be a whole of society and all of government type scenario uh, i don't think single hand is sufficient unless you end up with a big nine dictatorship who decides that corruption is all bad i don't care what the public says i'll just do it so in that scenario yes it can happen but in a normal democratic scenario pressure is applied from society uh, and society includes businesses then we need the two hands to make sure that reforms can actually take place and occur. Yeah. yeah, but having said that, I think it's also difficult when we have so many secrecy laws and uh, even today when the young people oh, want yeah. to go out and protest, you know, I think we all agree that uh, as much as we want the public to be much more empowered around uh, anti-corruption uh, demands, uh, it, it, it's just something that um, the people have been the victims of a very corrupt system. So it's a system that probably needs to change. Now, I just wanted to get to some Slido questions to give um, those who ask the questions uh, to the panelists so that you can answer it. Uh, one of it is um, it's quite provocative, but I think it will generate even more interesting answers. Do you agree that if experts are appointed as ministers instead of politicians will they need to uh will they then do a better job and then they report to parliament and uh will that actually be a system that uh, can actually bring us forward any comments I'll, I'll just start briefly on that i'm sure uh prof has got more to say um but uh, that essentially is a presidential system what happens in the US is you vote for the president, the president brings in his team, his team of ministers, all unelected, and then they fight against the Congress, the both houses of the uh, Congress. Um, in Malaysia, like in UK, it's a parliamentary system. So, so it's a Westminster system uh, whereby ministers are made accountable by being directly elected from their constituencies. Um, if you read the academic books on political systems, I think there are pros and cons to each of these systems. Okay? The, the Westminster system has got better chance of making sure that the executive agenda gets implemented. Because you have a majority in parliament, uh, you have a coherent government and parliament position, it gets implemented. A presidential system, yes, you get a panel of experts, but you are always in a confrontational position with the Congress. So they have their set of problems uh, in terms of agenda, objective, and carrying out the policies. So President Biden today might announce policy A. By the time it actually gets implemented, is A minus B minus C minus D plus F. You know, that, that, that sort of agenda comes out. Is that better? Is that worse? It's debatable. I don't think it's better or worse. It's just different. And how do we make each of these different systems work best in the interest of the people? Prof? Thank you. Yeah, uh, anyone else want to comment? Yes, let me comment on this because uh, this is an important question. Experts, not politicians, in that advisory role, if you like, because they supposedly know better. We have uh, an experience of this. The Council of Eminent People, which was appointed by the Pakatan. Uh, and uh, Mahate this morning drew reference to 1969 and 1997, when we had two crises. And at that time, two also a committee was formed to deal with this crisis. So Mahate, he was there in 1969. He, of course, he set it up in 1997, and the Council of Eminent People more recently was also his doing. What were the outcomes? History provides us with lessons to, from these uh, councils and what uh, they contributed in terms of were they positive or negative outcomes. Uh, we should look at that. That history will give us insights into whether how whether such a system is viable. My own feeling is I'm not very comfortable with it. If you look at uh, who are they accountable to, let's just take even the Council of Eminent People who were uh, appointed in 2018, 2019. Uh, 
they were given a lot of freedom in terms of collecting data, a lot of information was put in their hands. Uh, who did they account to? Where is the report? What happened to the report? I, that is that raises a red flag already, you know, and this is supposed to be a new government which is more democratic, uh, accountable, and these were the outcomes. So this raises a question of how such committees are appointed and who they are accountable to. Are they, I, I feel they should be accountable to parliament, to the public in some form, or a parliament. Uh, it never happened. And in the end, we never got to see that report. If you look at 1997, Mahathir claims that he set up a small committee to help deal with the economic crisis because he couldn't depend on the cabinet. The cabinet was just too big, so he set up a small committee and they apparently brought about these reforms which helped save the Malaysian economy. That's his opinion. Uh, he's entitled to it, but we haven't done enough research on that for me to make I for me to make a judgment call. So I my most recent account of this would be the, what happened in 2022. The experience has not been very good. So I would exercise caution. There must be accountability on people who govern to the people. What kind of system is put in place if we do appoint experts to do that? Now, I said, for example, GLC should be led by experts, people who, but they are not accountable to the prime minister or the finance minister appointed them. They have to be accountable to a special committee in parliament who has oversight about the running of the GLCs. And then we can have more checks and balance in the appointment of the GLC directors as well as how they conduct their business. So those are the things in here that I would prefer to look at. Parliament has to be reformed. We, the parliament, we need, we need good politicians there who have select committees who do this kind of work, you know, who do this kind of check and balance, and we can hold them accountable. If they don't do the work, I'm going to push for them not to be voted in the next election. And that's fair enough. You know, if they do their work, yeah. good, I, my own. they can put it back into the system. So let me end there. Let's hear for money. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Prof and Tony. Cynthia, uh, my question is whether an expert or politician to make a country better i think both of them must be a corrupt free leader that's important whether they can help us to have a institutional reform for the a better militia it's not the issue whether it's an expert we have many cases we have professional then we have failed to do a better to make the country better uh, what you call reform changes many cases many before we have uh, appointed a professional from become the cabinet members at the end of the day, we didn't see some ex some uh, what you call people from corporate. They never come and help in make a bit uh, changes in uh, law or provision or institutional reform. We never. So the issue is not the expert or politician, whether a leader, whether when they appoint as a member of cabinet or ESCO at the state level, they can play a better role to make a better Malaysia from corruption or good governance. That's more important. They have a must have the self uh, determination to bring, not uh, their background, the other politician. That's yeah, my. I, I think that that's the challenge. How do we actually get them to be corrupt free, to mm -hmm. have integrity and all that? That's the that's where we want to go. But how yeah, do we that's get? That's why yeah, Rasul Basto so so we have uh, earlier I share we have what they call the sector of uh, election free corrupt uh, corrupt free election. We need to have a leaders that can really fight for the, the interest and the interest of the people, interest of the riot, interest of the nation. We, I mean, the better militia is a better uh, militia that's uh, free from corruption, good governance, integrity. Right. Okay, we have 15 more minutes. I just want you to bring back, also steer back the conversation to the topic, which is corruption in, in um, development. And uh, for the panelists to also address the current situation, the pandemic, and how we're going to get out of the uh, mess. And politically is one thing we've been speaking about, but for the economy to move forward and to also highlight if there has been more corruption taking place during this time, because a lot of the, the uh, tender processes etc have been forsaken in the name of emergency so getting a lot of things done by direct echo uh, things are less transparent you have non-disclosure agreements with big farmers and uh, uh, different and new challenges because of the pandemic how do you see it affecting uh, corruption in general has it gotten worse 
and how we're going to get out of it to to look at uh, future development uh, in the short term at least. I know it's a long, big question, but uh, can you take like two minutes to answer this? Uh, the current challenges and the current issues of corruption in development. Perhaps I'll start having had some experience in government, uh, especially in MOF. Um, one of the challenges we faced when we first go in and put in the policy like uh, all everything must have open tenders. We create a we created a huge problem in government administration. It's quite easy to say that everything must be open tender, but to actually carry it out, it was a problem. It was problem a problem because by and large, the administration the way the government has been working, the civil service, has pretty much forgotten about tender processes. So it took a long time for them to get the act together. And preparing tender itself is a science and an art in itself. We have had tenders that were called and then realized that the tender documents was faulty Call back, cancel, call again, cancel again, and call again. Purely because the tender documents were not done in proper order, and that has created delays in administration, which created problems also for us because we get accused of inefficiency, we get accused of delays, we get accused of not delivering fast enough, not spending the money fast enough, etc. So it becomes a bit of a chicken and egg problem where we want things fast because this is a new government. We must show the people we can do things faster. And we want things proper. We want to start on the right basis. Everything must be open tender. And that was a challenge that we really faced. And given the current circumstances where the current government is all over the place, you, you can be assured that... Uh, all these pretenses of governance are uh, essentially thrown out the window for expediency. And it is when expediency happens that all the pot potential entrapments for corruptions will take place. But I, I just wanted to bring that point up to show that it is, it is, it is, it is a, a, an effort of political will an effort of patience, an effort of actually withstanding public pressure, even when trying to do the right thing, such as enforcing public uh, uh, open tenders in government uh, agencies. Let me build on. Let me build on what uh, Tony has said. I'd like to address specifically what. Cynthia has asked us to talk about, which is in the current pandemic situation, uh, how, how do we deal with this, especially the question of corruption? First, when the pandemic occurred, as I said earlier, we went into a lockdown. The lockdown was across the board. All companies had to go into lockdown. What did that mean? The government had no choice but to intervene in the economy in various ways to save the economy and to help people to get support there including in areas such as education. How were they going to do it? And here the GLC system, the ecosystem as they call it, comes into play. And here we have different types of GLCs. Uh, we have the GLICs, PNP, EPF, we have the banks, we have the telcos, and then we have DFIs, Development Financial Institutions. Let's just take some examples. I'll give you some examples. The telcos. We were told we are going to introduce 5G. Very important, especially now in the COVID crisis, you need to go. Telecommunications is the most important thing now, correct? Nobody disputes it. 5G. Next thing you're told, it's Huawei. And we're dealing with Huawei. Who decided? And before you know it, Huawei is out the window. And now we are told it's Ericsson. With a special purpose vehicle created by the government. Where is all the transparency and accountability and all these decisions that are being taken when we need to get the telecommunications sector moving quickly to help businesses and to help in education and other areas of society? That's what we are seeing today. Again, it indicates 
to my mind, a serious abuse of power with lack of accountability on the part of the government. Then we have other institutions like Bank for Bangunan, SME Bank, Agro Bank. We know people in the rural areas. We know that uh, we know that we need to get help into for food security issues into the agriculture sector. What is the role of Agro Bank, SME Bank? Ninety-eight percent of the corporate sector are SMEs, and most of them are micro firms. This is where the SME Bank comes in. Now there's a huge eco world there, GLC eco world. If you activate it, it can do wonders. And Tony spoke just now about the statutory bodies. Yes, we have statutory bodies, Kasada, Katanga, all in deeply embedded in rural areas where they do need help. Especially again in sectors like fisheries and uh, agriculture. Are they being deployed appropriately? There is the coordination between all these institutions to move into the economy. And is it being done in a transparent and accountable manner? Definitely not. So while there is a system in place, and this is what my basic concern is, we can do a lot more to save the economy. We can do a lot more to help the people if we employ the system properly. But it's not being done so. And this is the tragedy that we are confronted with. Today. Thank you, Cynthia. Cynthia, I have a short, of, short view on this. Uh, the pandemic yeah. actually gives us a, a very, what they call, a strategic uh, move forward to have a better give us a good lesson for us to improve our corruption, integrity, good governance, uh, uh, trust and uh, provision for the coming years. I think we, this is a good time place. Whether I going down, Prof talk about the ELC, Tony talk about the political angle there. I talking for the, uh, what you call the low ground bottom of the people, the raya, the workers example. In the raya, the workers, everyone, the, what they call entrepreneurs, uh, people, consumers. Do we have uh, adequate? Actually, this is a current scenario, current pandemic, give us a good perspective to go back and go back to the drawing board to have a better protection, better system, medical system, which is all free with a free corruption or what they call um, good governance, integrity. So, so I feel that is a good. Uh, good time to review. I think coming months, uh, our, our parliament can review all these things in a more or less manner. This is a good, uh, uh, what they call, uh, junction we are today. Okay, uh, Tony? Current pandemic, corruption, no? You're muted. Yeah, yeah. I spoke about it just now. Uh, well, somewhat indirectly, but basically is the is the fact that at this point in time it's a near free for all. And we have to trust the wisdom of those in power to carry out the procurement uh, as diligently and as uh, transparently as possible. One perhaps way to do this really is that uh, is that all transactions, be they open tenders or direct negotiations, be made public at all times to ensure uh, transparency and to ensure that you no, know, we the public is comforted that there's no abuse in the process. That's, that's, that's perhaps what what we can ask for at this point in time. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. The organizers have reminded me that uh, we are in the last few minutes of our session. Uh, is there any other issue that you wanted to raise with regards to uh, the topic corruption in development or the bigger issue of, uh, say, the coming general elections? Uh, any kind of message we want to put forward to the business community, to the politicians? Um, how is it that we want to ensure a more corrupt, free country in the future? Uh, you have you? about two minutes each to wrap up. Yes, can start? you can start. Because, uh, you saved the best for last. <laughs> okay, there's more. There, we did not discuss political finance. We have to discuss political finance. Who finances the political system? When we saw the court cases going on recently, we saw it it's so clear. 
Now, you talked about saving businesses. Businesses are also complicit in the financing of politics so that there's a quid pro quo. Uh, we want to bring an end to this nexus between politics and business, which has become so embedded in our political system. That is the issue which I feel the elephant in the room we are still not addressing. If we can have a very transparent and accountable financing of the political system, which is very important, we want to make sure our political parties are well financed so they can do their work. But we at the same time must ensure there's no state capture and no subservience to their funders. Then we can go a long way towards helping uh, bring about a uh, uh, reduction in corruption. I'm not saying that will end corruption, but it will definitely, to my mind, help reduce corruption. We have to have the Political Financing Act put into place as soon as possible. Okay. Um, Tony? Um, I'll go back to my where I started. Uh, there are many valid points uh, raised by Prof, which I think should be looked at. Perhaps uh, in dealing with them, a bit of differences in nuance, but that's fine. That's, that's about discussion. But it comes down to two things. Prof talked about the political system, the politicians. He also talked about businesses, which I deem as a society at large, their willingness to tolerate uh, corruption. I think both these sides of the equation must be resolved. If you just do one without the other, it's not going to work. You have to deal with both. You have to deal with politicians, you have to deal with the system, you at the same time have to deal with the businesses and the perception of corruption. If we, the society tolerates corruption, the businesses tolerate corruption, no matter how much reforms you do to the system, they will find a way around it to ensure that corruption continues to play a big part in the system in one way another that's, that's something we need to look at we need to look at both sides of the equation we need to look at the education and giving priority oh. sabotage that deliberate <laughs> it happened right at the time okay uh dr bunny you want to start okay I yeah yeah sure i have a few words yeah sure i can thank you okay um uh, I, we, I'm from the perspective of the Dorsua Busters. Uh, uh, we feel that um, we, we were already talking about the problem, corruption, good governance, integrity for many years. Yes. I think this is the time for us to stop it. Put a strong full stop there to stop it. And we need to have what we call, uh, everybody need to play their role, accountable. Not the politician, the public. Public means everyone, every segment of the uh, level people. Then we have a three level of people. One is a clearly corrupt free, right? One is a tangible. We can see some we are not seeing, but they're in the corrupt. So we need to get rid of the, these two groups. So that's why we recently, um, we have a process, we have a send a letter, open letter to the politicians, all the Wakir Rayat, 800 Wakir Rayat, through our letters. Please support our pledge to make our country as a, our beautiful country this is our country, to be the country as a corrupt free nation. I hope all the politicians will support all, every public, every public, 32 million or 24 million, those who want to get vaccinated, they have, they have, they are adults, will support us. By doing so, I think we can, we can achieve, we go back to your first question, whether we can achieve as soon as possible. I am support, Professor Gomex and you, we can do it. With that, uh, on behalf of Rasa Basas, I thank you to Cynthia and the organizer MUEC. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, but I think what's coming out also is that when you say we and us, uh, it all boils down to political will and it all boils down to uh, systemic change. And I, I wish Tony will come back because one of the things we need to affirm as we end the session is to address what both Prof and Tony also said, which is the nexus between business and politics. We have to address the structural problem, the systemic issues around this nexus and around how cozy the whole system has been since the 1970s. Uh, what do we do now? So we talked about in summary, the need for uh, independent institutions, that's really critical. But how do we get there is going to be really, uh, challenging because many a time it 
becomes very useful to have institutions that are not independent for those people in power. So how do we make them independent? Uh, that would be something really important to have strategies around. We talked about public procurement in a big way because this session was about development. So we need legislation and we definitely need a political financing law. Uh, as GE15 looms, I remember a lot of effort went into this for GE14. even went into the Pakatan Manifesto. But as you said, Dr. Mani, we have to do it. We have to do it. Even it can get into the manifesto after the political party wins, they will say, yeah, they didn't imagine they would win, so they didn't really mean it. So it is all about political will, commitment, integrity to actually uh, carry out and implement the promises. So at the end of the day, of course, the Rakyat has to watch the politicians, but we get back to where the systemic challenges are and what needs to be reformed. And finally, I think in conclusion, we had very good inputs from uh, different sectors of society. From Prof, who's an economic expert, Tony, who's actually who was sharing a lot about his experience in the finance ministry. And uh, journalist Raswa Busters, this new movement that's coming up, the Coalition of the Willing, getting private sector, getting academic, civil society, different types of groups to actually come together to fight corruption. And I hope when we meet next, we'll be able to meet in a more uh, enabling environment because right now it's probably the most complicated, most uh, difficult time that we are in, real conjuring. And we await Monday to see if we're going to have a new uh, situation before us. So thank you for that. Thank you again to uh, the organizers, the Malaysian University's uh, Economic Conference has put something very interesting over the weekend. I'm going to hand it back uh, to the organizers to end this session and to uh, inform of any other announcements. Thank you. Thank you to the chair for sharing so well. Thank you, Cynthia.